All right, thank you for uh, that brief break. That's not the real break. It's going to be a real break. I'm going to have more coffee and speak to each other. I uh, just want to make sure everyone was uh, mic'd up here. Um, producer Conrad is switching the slides. Yeah, there we go. Um, I'm trying to be relaxed and laid back here. Um, I wanted to start... Uh, you know, after having spoken to, to Sophie, uh, we need to start speaking about legislation. Let's do the heavy stuff first. When everyone has coffee now, let's, let's dive into it. And of course, start with the most Nordic panel today. Uh, we have uh, Sweden, uh, Finland and Denmark uh, represented, which is great. So we have Emilia Gedda, uh, Chief Advisory for Sustainability and Circular Economy for Finnish Textile and Fashion, Jenny Van, Director of Product Operations of Trust Race, and Julian Hutzel, co-founder of Momentum. Let's give them a round of applause. Um, and so, as I mentioned, since the last four years, we've been at Scandinavian Mind covering, doing research uh, on um, the need for new technologies uh, in the fashion system. And I think it was a couple of years ago, two and a half years ago, I started to get here murmurs, whispers about there's something happening in the EU. There's new legislation, there's new rules, regulations coming. There's an avalanche, there's a tsunami, there's th all these different words people use to describe this. And at first it was just like, there's something happening and I uh, tried to start to speak with people in the EU, see if I can um, understand what was happening. Um, and Last year at a Transformation Conference, uh, both in, in Helsinki and in Stockholm, we had uh, Mauro Scalia from, from Eurotex. He came and did uh, a session on, on uh, what was happening. And I think it was an eye-opener for many people in the industry, definitely for people present. But since then, when I speak to the industry, uh, this is something that, that is uh, either exciting or really nerve-wracking for people uh, in the industry. And we're going to try to uh, get a bit of an understanding of what this is. Uh, so I invited this Nordic panel um, uh, with, with three minds that are deep into what's happening. Um, and I thought maybe I'd start with you, uh, uh, Emilia. Um, uh, maybe just describe a little bit uh, about Finnish textile and fashion and your role there. And then we can get into the, the legislation stuff. Okay. <coughs> Thank you and good morning, everybody. Yes, so the Finnish Textile and Fashion Association is an industry association. So we represent the Finnish textile and fashion companies. We have approximately uh, 250 members. So, and they are companies that uh, uh, work with uh, textile in, in, in different uh, stages of the textile value chain. So raw material providers, brands, and also recyclers. And uh, yes, I have the privilege to work with uh, sustainability and circular economy issues. So something that um, takes a lot of my time is, is the legislation and, and especially the digital product passport of, of, uh, of the legis uh, le legislative actions. So our aim is to... Uh, provide uh, information to the policymakers from from the company views on different uh, uh, to different legislation and and have uh, have different kind of dis uh, discussions both on on national level but also on EU level and and um, at the same time we try to support the companies and in in this huge transformation, not mentioning tsunami, <laughs> but maybe something <laughs> like that. Um, can we, I know there, when, when uh, we had Mauro uh, um, uh, last year talking about this, there is, the, he had this image which, which still is frightening to me, with 16 different uh, uh, areas of legislation happening. If you could just highlight maybe uh, two or three or four, that's the most important, that's going to affect the, the fashion industry, w which would you mention then? If I need to mention some of them, so uh, one would be the extended producer responsibility for uh, for textiles, so meaning that uh, uh, the produ producers are responsible for the uh, uh, lifetime on the of the product, and uh, and then probably uh, going to marketing issues and talking about green claims, what you can 
what you can uh, say about your product or services or whatever you you provide that's a huge part but maybe the most important is the eco design regulation including digital product passport and also public procurement mm. i would say the the main is 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 the eco design we're going to get get into that, and uh, I also invited two people working uh, with uh, different solutions to help solve this for for the industry. But uh, before I mo move on from from you, Emilia, when you interact with industry in Finland uh, and and speaking to your member companies, uh, what is the kind of uh, sentiment when you when you speak to them? Are they worried? Are they curious? Are they what's what's the what's the emotion? Mm. Uh, I think we b they are both curious and worried because uh, everything is quite open at the moment. W we do have, for example, on the eco design, we have the framework. It, it was uh, 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 adopted uh, this summer, uh, but now we move into the delegated acts, the te textile specific uh, requirements and uh, uh, how how this will impact the industry. I think they are like uh, the companies are they would l like to have more information at the moment, but uh, but we are moving forward on this side. But at the same time, they are worried because it's uh, this is something that will transform the industry. How how will they be able to adapt to it? And and then also you need to do collaboration. You need to find new kinds of partners. Where do you find them? And so so this this huge change is ongoing, but also want want to make uh, mention that uh, many of the companies are really eager also to provide their expertise and and knowledge about the industry uh, in the uh, regulation process. So so that's a good thing. Let's double click on two things you said there. Uh, uh, there's a framework happening. What's a framework? Okay, so we have the. <laughs> I will try to explain this some way. So we have the eco design uh, regulation, uh, uh, and uh, as mentioned, it was adopted this summer, and uh, it's like a framework, like a big framework. It it uh, it it's um, to all most all products includes almost all products, not uh, not food or those, but uh, so and and uh, uh, the framework provides like. A maybe like guidelines on on what kind of uh, requirements uh, will be uh, 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 needed for products mm. and uh, and um, uh, and one uh, one of the requir requirements is is the digital product passport for example and then I also men mentioned, mentioned the delegated acts, and there we go. We have the framework, we have the big picture of what requirements will take place, and then we go to product-specific uh, requirements. So going into the delegated acts on that side. So and and in the delegated acts, we can take into account the the specificities of, for example, textiles. Then. Thank you for explaining. I know we're not going to make too much uh, legal technicalities, but it's sometimes interesting, I think, to double click on some of these concepts because they will affect, these are the concepts mm -hmm. that are happening that will affect the, the industry. Um, speaking of, of, of DPP, uh, uh, if you have followed our podcast, you've heard Jenny Van speak uh, l earlier this year or, or last year about a pilot project of, of DPP that you are uh, running in, in Sweden. Um, Maybe you can describe uh, yourself and your role, and we can get into talking a little bit about that pilot. Yeah, thank you, Conrad. Um, yeah, so I'm Jenny Van, and I'm working for Trust Trace, and our core is that we have solutions that help brands uh, discover their supply chains with intention to be compliant, manage risk, and especially then make an impact, change, and improve towards sustainability and preferably circularity. So that's the core. Um, but what we started off two years from now, was a pilot within DPP together with Maremeko and Kapal. This was super interesting um, because what we did was not only sort of setting up the end result as, an, as a consumer application for the consumer to, to view, but also a little bit to, to build on what you explained, what is DPP? 
it's both a system outlining, okay, so how should the data flow? How should be accessible? Who should access it? Because it is not only, you know, sending a spreadsheet to somewhere, but how can we exchange this data? And for this shirt, this shirt will own the data, not the brand that was producing this one. And we are looking towards, you know, all these regulations is coming for a reason. We will go to sustainability, we will go to circularity. So how do we build an IT framework to make this work? And then on top of that, we have sort of the DPP data. What information of this shirt should be included in this DPP and what should be shared to whom? Mm. To consumer to some, uh, some, some information and to authorities other information. So to, uh, I'm sorry if I'm dumbing it down uh, super simple, but in the future, EU will require that you scan a garment and get up information about this garment and its history and its materials and so forth. And that's the digital product passport. Am Indeed. I right? Yeah. yeah. Cool. In, in very simplified, that's yeah. the thing. Yeah. From a consumer view. But we also have an authority view that because the authorities would like to be more in control of what's entering Europe and what's potentially also leaving Europe mm. as landfills or whatever. Mm. Because in the SPR, we also have the waste directive. So there is, there is a need for data. And to be able to scale it, it's very easy to say, well, I can do this for three styles and so on. Then you can use spreadsheets. But how do you scale this when you have thousands of styles in a season? Then you need data. Otherwise, you need so many people and things will, the data will be incorrect. Nobody. You need the uh, IT yeah. as well. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, scaling, yeah. that's, that's why we need uh, to, to figure out in collaboration between fashion industry and IT industry. Right. And uh, before I let Julian in, uh, but just talk a little bit about the, you know, this pilot project is kind of about interpreting and guessing what's going to happen from a legislative side. It's not really clear, it's speci speci especially when you started two years ago. Yeah. It wasn't clear what w how this yeah. would end up. So you did some kind of guesswork, but I'm curious if you can just describe a little bit uh, what the process looked like when you do research on the upcoming regulations. Where do you find the information? Where do you do the research? Where do you, where do you, what documents do you read to, to learn about this? So within Trust Trace, we have, uh, we are not, we are a still a, a small company, but we have a few people, uh, including myself, that are doing a lot of research within sustainability. It's basically read what's coming out of the EU Commission, what's coming out of the EU Parliament, talk about, talk with other initiatives, because it's collaboration for uh, across the full industry. So it's reading, it's following up, it's it's being involved in these different initiatives w across countries, uh, various, we have policy hub as, as one driver in this as well. So reading, staying on top of it, and also from Trust Trade's point of view, merging with our knowledge in, okay, so what do we see coming, you know, we have ESPR, and, and what's really coming soon, it's EU DR, the deforestation regulation, and we can see this trend, the kind of data is actually the same. You know, it's, it's quite basic to start with. It's sort of map your supply chain. What's the facilities located? How do you drive that din down into the different tiers? What's the material composition? So yes, we can make it complex, but we can very much start simple. Mm, mm. It just know the basics, start there and you'll come a long way. Um, I don't think there's a, a, a coincidence that, that when we're talking legislation, I don't have a fashion brand up here. And, and I think actually this is a, a kind of an issue in the industry where the knowledge about these regulations uh, are, are not sitting on the brand side. And, and I think we can discuss why that is. I think brands uh, historically don't have, uh, you d they don't invest in that type of, of competence. Also, it could be quite overwhelming to just keep track of it. And we have an industry organization and then to kind of tech suppliers that is obviously in your interest to, to understand this because uh, of your solutions. Um, Julian, you are a, 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 a your company, you're kind of a colleague to Trust Race. You would say competitor. I don't know how you want to define yourself, but maybe uh, I'm, I'm curious friends. to have your friends. Exactly um, yeah. that we're all friends here. Um, 
uh, uh, talk about how you address this and maybe just describe yourself and your, and your solution first. Uh. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks very much and good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Julian. I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of Momentum. And we are an EU digital product passport enabler for fashion brands and suppliers. And we do uh, supply chain traceability and also lifecycle assessments. So um, kind of similar what also Trust Trace is doing, but we started off differently. So we started off, off as a brand. Um, so we were a circular sports brand before because we wanted to understand that we have actually access to all the suppliers. So from tier one down to tier four to the raw materials to final assembly. And then we actually got all of the information and we produced the products. And we realized that was in 2022 and realized hmm, maybe we could apply that to all brands and suppliers because there's an upcoming regulation, EU Digital Product Passport. And that's then what we did. Right. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a fascinating journey, I, I think. Um, how how do you st stay updated? Uh, what do you do within your uh, in your own daily life and maybe your team? Talk about how you stay updated on on these regulations. <laughs> we follow competitive <laughs> friends like Trust Trace. <laughs> 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 um, no, we have um, we have um, a consortium, or rather, like what we follow up on is Surpass. It's a consortium from the from yeah. the European Commission that is um, basically like a group that defines like the roles and the responsibilities and uh, yeah, what information actually should be entailed in the EU digital product passport that is then being imposed in 2028. And they're doing that from 2024 to 2026 now until like the first declaration act uh, one comes into s place. I think it's Q1 2026. Um, and then um, we in close contact to these people and ask them, of course. And then sometimes we also do research. We talk to brands. Hey, have you maybe heard about something else? Um, then you follow up on certain other guidelines like CSRD, EPR, green claims and we have the feeling that from this entire EU Green Deal that was imposed, I think, in 2019, and then with the uh, Circular Economy uh, Action Plan, that you have from all of these regulations that have been like imposed now, that the EU Digital Product Passport is literally the pinnacle of all. Right. So it's literally like the, 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 the end boss of fashion brands and suppliers to finally get the six million data points that every brand has to collect. And currently it's only like one or two percent that we have like identified that they have actually collected, um, that they need to get this in. So coming back to your question, um, it's basically everyone. Every conversation that you have, I see also some industry colleagues in the audience, um, PLM systems, PIM systems um, that help us a lot also to integrate them. And of course, like partners just like Trustrace, where other brands and suppliers use also other solutions. Mm. And they have to seamlessly interact with each other. If you think that you ha what we have, uh, according to Fashion Revolution at least, we have 140,000 brands around like in the EU. Um, momentum won't cover all of this, 100%. Mm. Or trust rates won't cover all of this. Um, and the supply chains are so scattered all around the world that we have to kind of like communicate with each other. And that's what we learn from each other as well. Right, right. Talk about the, uh, what's your impressions when interacting uh, with the brands? I'm guessing both you, Jenny, yeah. and Julian, when you, you interact with brands that are kind of proactive and want to do something, but what is the kind of sentiment when you speak to them? Are they, are they worried? Are they excited? They're like, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's basically like the same as in, uh, um, I, I, I like to compare that to games, like um, you have a football game maybe or any other game, until you have rules, basically everyone is just doing what they want, until you have rules in place. Right. And the game becomes also more interesting, more structured, and um, we have to like see it from a regulatory perspective, but also, in my opinion, from a common sense perspective. The common sense perspective is that you start off from we waste 12 kilo of fashion waste per year per person in the EU. That accounts of like 5 billion tons of waste that is being dumped in, I don't know, the Atacama Desert where like this fashion show has taken place. And then you have the regulatory directive because if we wouldn't put like any frameworks to it, this will continue at some point, right? Um, and then when we speak to brands about this, they see, okay, is, was that actually a marketing vehicle? I also seen like um, there is no sustainability section in CIF anymore. That was like two years ago. It was like a huge, huge thing actually. And uh, now the sustainability marketing channel has turned into something maybe obvious, maybe something common, maybe something that is already put into practice. Um, but they, what they feel is like the challenge is the main challenge: the communication with suppliers and the untax heaviness of suppliers. Mm. So how do you turn then suppliers into these tax heavy? dudes that basically don't only like um, uh, put in Excel or like type uh, data into Excel sheets, but also just like use a uh, platform like Trust Trace or, or Momentum in this regard or any other solution out there that is 
that is maybe suitable for them, where they just type in information. I went to India two years ago just like to understand how, um, with all the respect, how primitive um, raw materials providers on these cotton farms are working. And they're all sitting on their phones and watching YouTube. They, they, <laughs> can, they can communicate. Like the, mm. the impression that we think that they are not tax heavy is wrong. It's just like the education towards it. The and standards and tools aren't there. Exactly, no. exactly. And this yeah, no, you do kind of do the same thing. You, you're going kind of upstream and, and, and tracking uh, data. Do you see the same thing or, or what's your...? Uh, yes, I think suppliers are quite digital mature, yeah. actually. Uh, we have some, and there is some Sri Lanka apparel uh, industry that they are actually seeing, being, tra tracing their material to, to tier four. Mm. It's a competitive advantage in a couple of years. So they, the suppliers have already sta started this journey. And that is, of course, that is not coming across the f all, all of the globe. But there is some areas where suppliers also understand that hmm, this will actually come true. So start embracing it. And I think it's also a little bit dare to be disruptive here. Yeah. Because we, you know, 20 years ago we had DVD and now we have Netflix. 20 years ago we had a mobile phone, now we have a smartphone. So look at what happened to those companies that were actually daring to be disruptive, yeah. to see this as a business opportunity and not a threat. Because there is a lot of good, fun things we can do when we start to gather data. And, and looking at DPP, I mean, you can build a community with your consumers. Just think smart of how do you interact with them? How do you, you know, we did some other pilots as well before we actually know about QR codes and DPP there you can actually collect from your consumers if they would like to change to another uh, later season, what you do with these garments and so on. So all this data, there is so much opportunity with this one. Not only, you know, the boring regulator stuff that you need to do. Look at new business models. I, I, I love that. And we're, we're the, I, there are other panelists I see light up here. Uh, we're going to talk more about this later. Uh, Emilia, we mentioned, or Julian mentioned before, the, the communication side of things. And mm -hmm. as a uh, media brand uh, on the receiving end of many of the press releases, we can certainly tell that about a, a year, a year and a half ago, we stopped getting any press releases about sustainability or sustainable innovations or anything from fashion brands. Because and, and there, cause there's both this kind of green washing worry but also the, uh, it becomes a green hushing because brands are actually doing a bunch of things but they're super worried about saying the wrong thing or or uh, being on the wrong side of, of this legislation H how do you think we should navigate this because right now we, we're kind of in a trough mm -hmm. where no one's talking about sustainability because it's like we're super scared of it uh, i feel yeah uh yeah, we, we can see the same happening in Finland as well, uh, for example. But yeah, uh, I think w uh, like reflecting to DPP, it can always also provide, uh, as mentioned here, that it provides data, data that you can uh, use in your communication as well. You, like um, the thing is that we have read quite a lot of uh, different sustainability claims, but we don't have any evidence on the claims, and and that's uh, and uh, that's the problem. And how can you compare the different claims to each other? And there, so we need data, as mentioned again, data uh, and and. Uh, utilize the data available and in that way also move forward but at the same time we have the green claims directive in the pipeline so uh, trying to uh, like uh, create uh, similar uh, rules in the communication but the something that is behind that is also the data. You need to have the data available and, and make your uh, different claims uh, based on that. Right, right. I want to pick up on something uh, Jenny said, and I wonder if you feel the same thing, that there right now it's we're also in a situation where, where we talk so much about compliance and there's uh, there are rules there are regulations we have to you know comply to them uh but there do you see other opportunities here as well that, that we shouldn't only see this as some sort of dreadful thing ah oh, i have to invest in a bunch of things but uh to, to what end what are the opportunities a brand should look at yeah. 
I like to look at this that uh, we have sustainability and then we have the compliance part. Yeah. The compliance is something that you need to do, but you can build on. If you want to be sustainable, you can move forward right. like on that part. And, and there also we will have, for example, the DPP, we will have the uh, requirements that should be mm. uh, 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 according to the legislation. But there's different kind of kind of data also av available that you can collect and utilize and then like uh, uh, make business plans based on that one so uh, um, even though it's a, a huge transformation you you should look at it as an opportunity as well because when you have data you can be uh, make data di driven uh, dis decisions and uh, and uh, as mentioned, you can communities make use of the data that you have, make have a conversation with your customers through digital means and, and uh, these kinds of opportunities there are. Like I think there's a huge amount of them. Mm. I don't know what <laughs> those are, but <laughs> there's a huge amount of them. We could obviously talk about uh, legislation all morning, I think. Uh, we have to round up now for the, for the next session, but bef before I, uh, I, I leave you guys, um, uh, what is your uh, advice to a, a fashion brand that wants to get started, that hasn't started yet? What are some of the first steps they can, they can take? Uh, I want to hear this from all of you. Maybe Emilia, you can start. Okay. So uh, the first thing, yeah, uh, as mentioned here previously, have discussion with your uh, with your partners. Have discussions about the legislation. What's going on? What's happening? Not not just about o on the legislative side, but and not just in EU, in like in the world. So and um, and then we, <laughs> as the Finnish textile and fashion uh, association, we we are happy to provide uh, our members information uh, about the uh, the development on the regulative side and then we also uh, have different kind of, of projects ongoing so we try to like m match fashion industry and for example IT mm. industry together and and uh, have these kinds of uh, discussions uh, even though I just mentioned the Finnish, uh, Finnish side, uh, side uh, we also do collaboration on Nordic level with Sweden and with uh, Denmark so maybe Collaboration would be the one and only word I would Wonderful. use here. <laughs> Jen and Julian, real quick now, the w where to start? Um, I, I think I just quote Sandra Rose at Capal, and uh, she said, uh, this is not a sustainability or IT department problem within a brand. It is within the full brand, including sourcing, making sure that you have the full company uh, around the table when you talk about this. And then uh, start with identifying some I, I haven't seen a good solution in-house built yet, so um, collaborate and partner up with some solution of your choice uh, for traceability. Uh, start there, start interact with your suppliers and uh, build this long term. It's going to take a couple of years before you are fully transparent. It's not something a CEO should delegate to just one person and like fix this now. No. <laughs> he, he should be involved and curious of progress. Yeah, yeah. Julian? Fix this and fly out to every supplier. <laughs> And handing over candy now. Uh, jokes aside, um, um, I get reminded of a um, of a quote from a designer that we were working with, um, where I was asking, "Hey, is actually sustainability or regulation killing in um, killing design? Because this is mostly like the type when you have like new recyclable materials. Can you actually work as a designer with that?" And she said, um, "If you can't work with upcoming regulation or like with new materials, you're not a good designer." Mm -hmm. So. Um, this is kind of inspiring from the sports brand as well. Um, we, like when I go back like to the momentum case, how we started, like it took us one and a half years to get our entire supply chain in place, to get all data and people to sensitize them that this is actually important. Also as a marketing channel that we use it now with our brands with, like we don't call it EU DPP, we call it digital tag because it's not an EU DPP yet. So also like um, getting on your words, it takes like two or three years. So yeah start talking to anyone that you like collaborate with or which system you use, PLM systems, PIM systems or anything like that. And then we can all make it happen at some point. And it's of course for the sake of our kids and our future. Like that's mm -hmm. what we always have to keep in mind. It's like it is a regulation. It is at some point annoying, but in the end it's for a good cause. 
Also beautiful words to end with. Uh, we can all make it happen. Emilia Gedda, Jenny Van, and Julian Hutzel, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Mm. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We're gonna